Hello, everyone. Uh, glad you could join us. My name is Philip Martin. I'm a senior investigative journalist at WGBH Radio and Television in Boston. Uh, we produce programs like Frontline, but we also focus on local. And like everyone else in the world right now, uh, we are focused on that which is killing, uh, at this point, over 500,000 people uh, uh, internationally across the world, uh, COVID-19. Uh, and we are going to talk about this today and how journalists are covering this and should cover it. I'm uh, talking with uh, my colleagues uh, in different places around the world who, are, who have been looking at the coverage and who themselves are journalists. Uh, I'm joined from Kenya by Thomas Buweri. Uh, I've known Thomas for a long time and uh, for the last eight years, he's been working as a radio broadcast journalist at Pomoja FM, a community-based radio station located in Kibera slums. And in his reporting, Thomas focuses on education and empowerment of the Kibera community. He'll tell you more about himself in, in just a moment. And uh, he has been focused on how this horrible situation, this pandemic has been wreaking havoc on Kibera and, on, uh, and throughout Kenya. I'm also talking from Brazil, from Sao Paulo with Wagner de Alencar, who's co-founder and correspondent of Paris Sopolas since 2010. He's currently co-director of something known as Agencia Mural, this extraordinary project. Uh, born in Bahia, Sao Paulo is at the heart in, uh, of his writing these days, and he's focused on the favelas, the, um, the slums of um, surrounding uh, Sao Paulo and, uh, and uh, Rio de Janeiro and other places. He's also the author of a book called Sadaje uh, do Paraiso, There is Life in the Largest Favela in Sao Paulo. Uh, and also welcome Wagner. And from the UK, we have Anna Lekas Miller. Uh, she's currently a communications manager with the Media Diversity Institute in the UK, but she has covered all of the Middle East or at least most of it. Uh, she's an independent journalist who's, who covers war and conflict with a particular eye on the impact of war, conflict, and migration on women. Uh, she has worked in Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Turkey, and Iraq, uh, filing stories for the Daily Beast, The Intercept, you name it. Um, and uh, she fiercely believes in freelancers advocating for other freelancers. Uh, that's also uh, a belief I share, Anna. And welcome all of you. Let me make sure, uh, Thomas, why don't you turn your uh, uh, microphone on? Uh, we're gonna unmute everyone. Okay, Anna, you, Wagner, I have everyone turn. Okay, let's make sure we can hear all of you. Okay, so uh, welcome. Uh, I'm going to uh, just get a few, uh, just one question from you and then uh, you can, um, and then, we, and then we'll go around. Um, this is um, the International Center for Journalists Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. This, and this is yet another webinar in, uh, in the context of that forum. And today we're looking at how journalists should and are covering uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 in quote unquote minority communities. We're gonna take a, we're gonna look at that term a lot closer first of all. Uh, because the term in itself may be problematic. Uh, so why don't we start, uh, Thomas, with, with you in, in, in Kenya. What does it mean, first of all, to be a minority uh, in, um, in, in Kenya and in, in Kibera? And what does that mean in, uh, in the context of coverage of COVID-19? Thank you so much, Philip. And uh, this is Thomas from Nairobi, Kenya, Kibera Slums. Uh, basically, for me, I'm a journalist based in this slum, and I cover state community based uh, related stories. And from my understanding, what it means to be a minority is because it's, it's like, for example, like in Kibera, it's a slum, it's an informal settlement that has uh, many residents who live in this location. Uh, it means they are not proper infrastructure. It means you don't have access to maybe running water every day. And these are people that are always marginalized by the system of the day because uh, they don't have all the facilities as expected of other citizens uh, in, the, in the country. 
One thing I'll do, I wanted to share a photo that you took. You've taken quite a few photos of the, of, of the situation in uh, Kibera, uh, which is stereotypically regarded as um, East Africa's largest slum. And, and we, you can ask, I, can, I want to talk to you later about what that means, uh, that stereotype, which is also happens to be a, a stereotype based on facts. But here's one of your, um, your Instagram photos that I think uh, I'd like to share with folks. Uh, can you talk about that uh, mural for just a second, this photo? Well, thank you so much, Philip. Uh, basically, this is because uh, for the community in Kibera, uh, the community is also coming, trying to come up with their own solutions. Uh, because uh, I know there's the issue of the social distance, it's a challenge here. As much as the WHO recommends that uh, people maintain social distance, uh, people wear a mask, uh, it's a challenge, especially for my community. And for me, I go around taking photos of what is happening and trying to tell stories from the community, like, you know, this is what's happening on the ground. And when i talking, just uh, talking about this image, it's a community mural that uh, is, 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 one of the, is uh, along one of the walls that has a lot of traffic of people who just walk across the bridge because it's under the bridge. So a lot of people uh, walk across the bridge to see this mural. And the idea because behind this mural is just to make people understand. As much as we have these issues of maybe hand washing, wearing a mask, social distance, but yes, the committee is using these public murals to still educate people to understand and to just have these key messages go into their system that as they carry along their day, whatever they do in the community, they just remember that, hey, I need to be wearing a mask, I need to be washing my hands, I need to keep distance. Yes, Philip. Okay, uh, Thomas, thank you. I'm going to have you mute your mic now. We'll turn to Anna um, in the UK. Um, Anna, welcome once again. Um, Thanks for having me. <laughs> the coverage there, uh, like uh, the uh, everywhere, is uh, it seems like the UK under Boris Johnson started very, very late in terms of addressing this issue. Uh, can you talk about, uh, I know its impact has been largely, again, uh, on, on so-called minorities. Again, we'd like to investigate what that term means. Uh, but how would you describe the coverage there? And what exactly is a minority? Uh, in the UK, and how has the situation in a broad sense been covered? Sure, so um, I work at Media Diversity Institute where we're looking at how media is covering minority communities, and at least in that context, we're talking about racial minorities, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, people with disabilities, young people, elderly people, and really using this as a lens with which to see their experience of a given subject such as the coronavirus so when this started happening it was really clear to me and my team that this was going to be impacting working class people of color this was going to be impacting people that you know, couldn't necessarily stay home and work from home and so i really started looking at how the whether or not the media was even investigating this issue and interviewing people from these communities and seeing how this was playing out, which they did. It's unfair to say that the media didn't do this, but it seemed like it only happened when it was too late, that it only happened when it became people of color being twice as likely to be infected, even dying from the virus as people who were not from minority communities. So I really think that this, this could have been avoided if if this would have take, been taken into account more from the start. Thank you very much, Anna. I appreciate that. Sometimes you have to remember that, we're, <laughs> that one is muted. Uh, we're all dealing with this new technology. Exactly, the new technology, exactly. Um, no, I appreciate that. The, the, the whole notion of, again, what it means to be a minority is a question I've also liked to present to, uh, uh, to ask uh, Wagner in, um, in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, Wagner, if you can unmute your, uh, your mic, uh, what, what does it mean to be minority and, and how would you regard the coverage in a broad sense? Uh, and by the way, I noticed uh, yesterday in Folia uh, de Sao Paulo that uh, they have started a campaign uh, that's relative or seems to be related to uh, this issue, uh, but also to the, uh, to the question of Bolosaro's Gerard Balasaro, the president's role 
uh, in uh, sort of um, backtracking on this thing we call democracy. Uh, first of all, I, I'd like to apologize for my bad English. <laughs> I hope everyone can understand me, despite my, my lack of fluency in the language. But uh, Brazil is a continental country. When we talk about minorities, we are talking about uh, indigenous, uh, black uh, people. But from my perspective, uh, I'm talking about people who live in the favelas. Brazil, there are a lot of uh, favelas, uh, peripheries uh, here in Brazil. I live in Sao Paulo. Uh, just in Sao Paulo, there are more than 12 million people living in, in the outskirts here. Uh, I grew up in the largest favela in Sao Paulo. So, so I know what, uh, what means uh, discrimination, segregation, uh, so when we talk about minorities, we can talk about residents of the favelas, for example. And, and in this context of, uh, of this a scenario, political scenario with Bolsonaro, for example, we have been fighting uh, with the president because they, they, because he, he, he he has been fighting with the press because oh, all, all is fake news uh, for Bolsonaro. <laughs> so we have been uh, facing a difficult moment uh, here in Brazil. So uh, the favelas always uh, existed, but uh, seems like everyone, and especially the, the mainstream media, uh, started to look at this place. Uh, Thinking, thinking about, wow, people, there, there's lack of water. Oh, people don't have access to internet because the coronavirus pandemic uh, show, uh, show up the, all this inequality that always exists. So my work at uh, Agencia Mural uh, for 10 years, is to show this inequalities, to show that the, the favelas, uh, the peripheries are plural, are diversity. Uh, it, 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 it is something uh, like just now people and, and the governors and including the press started to look at, you know. I gotta tell you, uh, we, we all share uh, a lot in common here in the United States, of course, uh, the coverage of the um, of the pandemic can probably be divided in various ways. You have a straightforward uh, coverage of uh, cases of both uh, deaths and uh, of uh, infections. You have uh, contact tracing uh, data, uh, and then there are in in depth stories looking at the role of the leadership, the president of the country, and how bas and he basically dictates the agenda. So you have a president who began by holding uh, coronavirus press conferences, but at those press conferences dispensing extraordinary uh, degrees of misinformation, disinformation, and uh, just extraordinary uh, degrees of falsehoods, uh, more accurately de de uh, described as lies. Um, and the, the, uh, this, of course, is I'm speaking of Donald Trump. Um, and. And, I, and what leaders tend to do, of course, is they, report, they create a situation where they try to make themselves look good. Reporters' jobs are to report what the leaders are saying. And then it becomes necessary to ask the question, um, how much of this should we take uh, 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 as, as truth? And how much of this should we take as the appearance of truth? Or in some cases, just downright, you know, like incredulous information. So we've had that situation in the United States where people have been reporting what the, the words of Donald Trump, and, but the journalists have gotten to the point where they, have not, they no longer look at uh, what he says uh, uh, as, as truth. There's at, at the very beginning an extraordinary degree of skepticism for someone who is constantly engaged in, uh, in, in telling things that are untrue, particularly about poor communities. I'm wondering if you could talk about since coronavirus 
uh, COVID-19 is, is disproportionately poor people, disproportionately affecting poor people. And many journalists, of course, come from backgrounds that are, uh, that are, that are the op very opposite of that quite often. How uh, have journalists from non-poor, non-persons uh, uh, of color, or if you will, minority backgrounds, how do you think they're covering this? Or do they cover this largely through, through the frame of reference of its leaders? Or do you think there is something, a, a more deeper effort? And you can point out specific uh, press or media groups, if you like, BBC, uh, Folio. You could talk about uh, uh, the press in, uh, in Kenya, Radio Kibera. Uh, Thomas, uh, why don't you start, that, uh, start off that discussion? if you will. Okay, thank you so much, Philip. Uh, maybe just from my perspective is that, uh, uh, for, for me personally, as a journalist based in Kibera, uh, maybe I can just share how I've been approaching my reporting uh, from a journalistic perspective. Uh, basically for me, I've just been trying to, when you walk to the community, you get to hear, talk to, uh, but in a cautious way. So I also try to keep distance, have my mask on. Uh, but also when you listen to the members of the community, the issues that are coming out, like especially, uh, like Kibera has had issues like uh, people lost jobs, for example, uh, especially like the women who washes clothes in, in uh, high-end estates. Uh, we also have these people, we call them like slum tourists. Uh, like now we don't have any foreigners coming to visit Kibera, for example. Uh, they have lost income, they don't have any income at the moment. Uh, we have five cases, we had, we have five cases whereby like families are struggling with food issues. So for me, like, you know, when you talk to the members of the community and also just visually walk through the community and get to see these issues, uh, that's how you are I'm able to come up with my story ideas uh, and uh, just to push them out in the, like through a platform so that uh, people are able to understand the, like, yes, from a minority community like Kibera, for example, this is how a local journalist is trying, is trying to bring out the issues. Yes, we have the pandemic, yes, but also we see this is how, from a local perspective, this is how I'm, I'm trying to approach the issues that by just bringing out these unique stories to the world. And, and basically, like just talking to these people and what I've also done in some cases is like just a phone call away, like calling a source and asking them to record uh, maybe a voice message on WhatsApp or even just a video call. Or you can just send some photos that they think can be used uh, for our items. Uh, so that uh, I'm also trying to avoid going into crowded places so that I'm also safe from COVID, contracting the COVID, uh, COVID from my side as a journalist. The, uh, one of the things, I've, uh, uh, before we go on, I just want to mention again, I, I sort of moved too fast on this, is in in Kibera, uh, you have um, what has for a long time been regarded as so-called tribal politics. Uh, in the context of that, uh, how is this issue, just briefly, how is this issue covered? And I ask that question because we get back to this issue of minority. Uh, Wagner described it as a minority uh, in, uh, in looking at people in the favelas or in, uh, in indigenous people. Uh, Anna talks about, uh, for example, their South Asian communities uh, and Caribbean communities. Uh, what would you describe as a minority uh, in, uh, in Kibera and the type of coverage they receive, again, since so much of this is informed by stereotypes? Thank you, Philip. Uh, basically, like how the Kibera is reported like in the world is that we are always taken as people who are living below a dollar per day. Uh, which is not the case anymore because I know there are so many energetic people, people like are earning like a decent living from their daily household. Uh, uh, but as like, like even during the COVID, uh, during these COVID times, because uh, I remember there's a time that like, Kibra had uh, uh, reported like 49 cases of like Corona, like positive cases, like uh, around the month of May, uh, May 29th. Uh, and, and you see, the way the media was reporting about Kibera was that uh, there was a possible lockdown that was coming. And then that brought so much fear in the community because people thought like, hey, if Kibera is locked, what does it mean for us? It means we can't move out of this location. We can't go out to hustle like the way we are used to. 
and and this like almost came it was reported like in the mainstream media uh like almost for a whole week and there was so much fear like every day like when you walk out you guys are like hey thomas you are the journalist out there do you think the government is going to lock you better and i'm like okay uh let's wait and see but if you keep on our precautions if we try to ensure that uh we have our community solutions i think maybe the government might, might reconsider which after when the president addressed the nation last month it we, we, we never got that lockdown uh, and i'm not seeing so much reporting like in terms of like yes Tibera was not locked down because of the increase of numbers but what has been happening what like i've not seen a journalist coming to say uh yes this 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 was the projection from the ministry of health but as it is now uh they have tried to come up with their own solutions so that's the gap that me as thomas from habari kibra and the team we've been trying to bridge this gap by trying to ensure that uh we bring these local voices out there to see to show the world that these are the solutions that we are coming with from this community okay so thomas thank you very much uh the um i'm going to remind folks again that we are you're tuned in to uh the international center for journalists our global health crisis reporting forum. Today, we're focused on the coverage of uh, this, uh, of the pandemic uh, in the context of so-called minority communities. I say so-called because this for a long time has been a, um, a term of contention in the United States. We, we basically uh, toggle between the term people of color and minority because in so many places, the minority is the majority. Uh, and the minority connotes otherhood uh, so often that folks fo refer to themselves um, either as, uh, again, a majority or refer to themselves as people of color uh, or, or, of course, use their, uh, uh, their ethnicity or whatever their quote-unquote minority status is to denote themselves. Um, I want to talk of, for, um, for a second, Anna, about journalism in the UK from the BBC uh, to the Guardian, uh, we know that it's overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly white. Uh, how has this impacted of uh, the issue of in uh, inequities and inequalities in uh, South Asian uh, Caribbean communities, and for that matter, in some of the poorest communities where uh, COVID-19 has had its most um, uh, deleterious impact? Yeah, I think like you were saying earlier as well, you know, so so many journalists here also are coming from these very pedigreed educational backgrounds like Oxford and Cambridge. So it's not only white, but also, you know, very wealthy backgrounds, which just means that these lived experiences of being of experiencing poverty or racism is very rarely actually in UK newsroom. So then when, when you, you have a story that's affecting people of color so much, that's affecting working class people so much, it takes them that much longer to first get to the story, to have access to people to interview, to even understand it. And you, you notice among some of the journalists too, like sometimes you know, if a story that doesn't necessarily initially cross their mind comes to them, every journalist is skeptical about something that maybe they haven't encountered in their own lived experience. But when you have this lack of newsroom diversity, you have this lack of perspectives that's not saying, oh yes, that's a story that we should go cover. This is very important. We need to be speaking truth to power in this way right now. So by not having newsroom diversity, you are absolutely doing a disservice to your publication, to your audience, to the people that you're supposed to inform. And, and it's a big problem that needs to be improved in this country and many other places as well. Okay, Anna, thank you. Um, Wagner, uh, uh, this question. Um, the, the president of uh, Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro, has downplayed the pandemic even as it um, ravages poor communities in the favelas. Uh, what should journalists do? Uh, for example, uh, the uh, uh, Folio de Sao Paulo or, or uh, uh, the uh, uh, papers out of, out of uh, Rio to guarantee that these stories are being reported <clears throat> accurately uh, when the information being given out by the government is misleading or worse. So, uh... 
since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, President Jair Bolsonaro has minima uh, minimized the disease. So he even called uh, little flu. <laughs> He said some people were going to die uh, and the economic uh, couldn't stop. So with that million of people, millions of people following the, the president's words, you know, denying the disease. So this is a, a huge problem. For you, to have, uh, for you to have an idea, Philip, uh, he hasn't worn uh, a mask at some events or cities he visits. Uh, and another thing is uh, that he's having a fight with the press, as I told you before, in general, except some, some stations that support him. Uh, also, in, in last month, uh, the governor, uh, uh, the federal government, uh, has tried to hide the data of the number of the deaths, so it was <laughs> a problem. So, some big newspapers here in Brazil, uh, they joined forces to put the data together themselves. And uh, it was a, 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 an incredible initiative for in São Paulo and another, uh, uh, in another uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, if if uh, on the one hand we talk about uh, social, economic, uh, etc., uh, inequalities. On the other hand, we're talking about uh, inequalities of information. Uh, that's the reason we exist. Uh, that this, the, the reason would now exist, for, for example. And here in, in, in my job, we obviously uh, show the numbers of what's happening. Uh, but our concern, more than that, is to, to, to show the residents of the peripheries what they need to do to take care of themselves. Because if presidents say, no, it's not a problem, it's a little flu, but more than 6,000 people are dying, we are facing a, 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 a big, big problem. Uh, from uh, our work here uh, in Mural, we focus our attention to cover the, the pandemic and uh, in March, on March, we, we launched a podcast uh, to try to get closer uh, uh, of our audience, you know? So literally with the voices of those who are feeling the problems caused by the, the coronavirus. And one uh, important information uh, uh, I can uh, tell you is that uh, beyond uh, I study by Avaz. Brazil is the, is the number one country to, to spread uh, fake news. So uh, fake news in, uh, by WhatsApp. So we, we, now we have the WhatsApp to send this, this podcast. Because you know, people uh, in favelas don't have good access to internet. So we send these podcasts uh, directly to, to, to people uh, by, uh, by using WhatsApp. So we have, to, we, have, we have to try to find a ways to get closer to our, 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 uh, to our audience. We, we get happy uh, about mainstream media worry uh, and uh, join, join themselves to to, to give people this information and, and the, the real numbers. So it's, uh, we have been uh, living uh, uh, local initiatives like as Agência Mural and this, this, yeah. uh, this mainstream media. I gotta tell you, 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 you answered, uh, 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 you, in many ways you answered the question that was posed by um, uh, Valerie. I think this is Valerie to all panelists. Um, who asks, what do you believe as the, uh, to be the most effective tool to challenge the narrative by governments who are intentionally misleading marginalized communities? Additionally, how can these governments be held accountable? At least for the first part of, of that question, 
the notion of a podcast coming through WhatsApp, that is brilliant. Uh, we have to try that here. Uh, they, I'm very serious. They, the notion of sending it directly to folks, uh, a lot of, I don't think we always utilize the audio portion of WhatsApp. Uh, and that is a good way to, uh, uh, to, to use that. The second part of that question though, which I thought was very important, uh, which was how can governments be held accountable? Um, and one of the things I noticed, Anna, that occurred in the UK is that after uh, the, the prime minister uh, developed COVID-19, the narrative seemed to change. And one of, of, that was critical of the British government's uh, response uh, to this uh, disease that was uh, disproportionately impacting marginalized and poor communities to one that was largely sympathetic toward the prime minister. Uh, and, and some of the critical aspects of that coverage seem to have disappeared once the uh, prime minister himself developed COVID to the point where even the very doctor who had warned the prime minister about this passed away. Uh, and there seemed to be barely any mention of his role in warning the prime minister. Uh, I hope that this is not too subjective a, um, a frame, but that is the impression I got. Can you talk about that? How can, how can, this, how can the, the British government be held accountable, for example? Absolutely. I don't think it's too subjective a frame at all. I think you're asking all the right questions because because at that moment you did you did see a very kind of nationalist type of rhetoric because you know you saw that you know the media was very much kind of preparing people for the possibility of Johnson's death and and then and then he recovered, but there was no there was no, you know, question of like, oh, he recovered because of course he's the person who gets put on a ventilator before he probably needs it because he's the prime minister and he's wealthy and white and has access and has all of these things that so many people don't have. And we, you know, I mean, countries like the UK and the US are allegedly democracies and are, you know, legitimately in some ways, but, you know, this issue of holding, holding leaders accountable is something that we need much more in our journalism in times like these because 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 they are spewing misinformation they they do they do have their own agenda and it's it's you you see journalists so much just absolutely repeating what they say and often journalists are repeating you know not just falsehoods but sometimes even dog whistles to you know in the case of Trump in the United States and it's really journalist's job to turn that around, be holding them accountable, and be reporting in these impacted communities and take that information and pose it to our leaders. You're, sorry you're about that. Again. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I, I think for sure that uh, we too often, uh, I, I think there's been a lot of good journalism in the U.S. Don't 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 get me wrong, but we also in uh, journalism, of course, it's very broad. Uh, we have a uh, conservative journalist uh, represented by Breitbart, uh, uh, for example, and we have um, mainstream journalism represented by New York Times, Washington Post, um, and we have uh, uh, left uh, wing uh, journalism uh, represented by the Nation magazine, for example, or Mother Jones. Uh, but I think everyone can agree on on what is tr what what should at least be considered facts. <laughs> of a lot of folks are problematic about what can be truth, <laughs> but we should at least agree on what is facts. And 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 we do uh, see that a lot of the those things that are uh, that are known as facts totally eviscerated uh, by <laughs> by the Trump administration uh, I, by uh, by the. Uh, administrations in uh, Brazil and in Kenya um, and in, uh, in the UK. So how do we basically agree? How do we basically get to this point of, of, of establishing, if you will, verifiable, objective, indisputable facts in reporting? I would think that data is one way, certainly, of doing that. Uh, data is very important. Can you talk about the role of data uh, in your reporting? Uh, anyone? Um, perhaps we'll have to go back to Thomas. 
Uh, uh, thank you, Philip. I, I think when it comes to data, uh, as journalists, we need to be able to verify, counter check, and still talk to multiple sources because sometimes we get like uh, sources from one source. But if you can also always also go beyond just one source, uh, maybe go talk to the relatives again on the ground, get to hear their story, and just to see are these numbers adding up. Because sometimes you get these numbers that are shared. And then once you just start to go back uh, to invest, we just follow up on the track to see uh, how have we been faring in terms of maybe cases reported in Kenya. Uh, look at the graph, you know, is it going up, is it going down? Uh, in terms of the sex, uh, are we having so many male getting COVID-19? Uh, is it female? Uh, are they children? What are the age groups? Uh, and then also looking, like for me, looking at the data maybe from Kibera perspective, huh? I also want to understand, like in which, because Kibera is very broad, because we have this slum bit of it, and we also have the, the other area that is not a slum. So looking at, you know, these cases that uh, are reported like every day, Kibera, uh, nine cases, for example, Kibera, uh, 19 cases, Kibera, 15 cases, for example, how are these people distributed, distributed like in these regions? Is it like just, are these people just coming from one area, like that is the slum area alone, or are these people also coming from other like estates like uh, that are well off, that are more, uh, of middle class people? So for me, that's how I, I, I can approach that element of data, just to understand the diverse uh, information that I'll want to, to dig deeper, just beyond the figures that I'm getting from maybe relevant sources. Back to you, Philip. Uh, uh, thanks, Thomas. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I think I should also um, mention here in the US uh, that one reason why, for example, you're seeing the uh, governors of two of several states here, Florida and Texas, uh, having to turn around a rosy image of, uh, of what is happening in their states. The reason they've had to turn those around is because the data, the data, the data doesn't lie. They're, the case, the cases are going up, and so therefore it is uh, uh, clear clear that the disease is ravaging. A larger percentage of the population. But let me also mention, in, in our earlier discussions, uh, this with the panelists, uh, you may remember we talked about why we got into journalism, and I think we, we all agree that we got into journalism because we were having a hard time as in, in our youth, and uh, you're a lot younger than I am, but in our youth, basically agreeing, uh, basically having a hard time with how we were being portrayed in Detroit, where I grew up. Uh, I got into Detroit, I, I got into journalism, uh, and it had long been part of my thinking, uh, my, my, my future spec, if you will, what I would become. Because I had a, it, was, it was problematic to see how the place where I live was being portrayed by newspapers and television uh, and magazines. Uh, and it, bear, it, it bore no resemblance to what I was experiencing in my own neighborhood. And so I think when we bring this to the moment uh, where we're covering COVID, we also, again, something Thomas said, uh, uh, we, the notion of coverage on the ground is so absolutely important. And my advice, for example, to mainstream journalists uh, is while coupling, coupling the data with those voices right on the ground, uh, it's also, we can also see how the Black Lives Matter uh, issue is seeping into this discussion because suddenly voices that may have been marginalized yesterday are being, uh, are being talked to today. Individuals who were ignored three days ago are suddenly part of the discussion. Uh, and I just wanted to throw that out as well. I'm going to go to a question from a fella, uh, Jorge Bain, in, uh, that's a uh, Brazilian name, <laughs> but uh, so it's, it's George Bain. Uh, is that right? Uh, in Costa, Costa Rica, uh, I'm a Costa Rican anthropologist, got it. Living in Washington, D.C., I study the interaction between scientists, uh, policymakers, and journalists. So I'd like to ask what has been the role of any of media in pushing policies in one direction or another locally or globally? 
uh, in relation to COVID-19. Uh, is that, um, who wants to take that on? Uh, Philip, uh, 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 as you, I grew up in Paraisópolis. Paraisópolis is the largest favela here in Sao Paulo. And I couldn't see myself uh, in, in, the, in the media. So uh, uh, this, work, uh, this work at uh, uh, Agência Mural reflects uh, our mission, what we want to our mission that it, it, it's bringing to, to, the, to the center of the story, the, the, the favelas, the, the periphery. So uh, I think when we talking about uh, data, uh, as, as Toma, uh, Thomas told us, we, we think about the, the having the numbers uh, indicate that uh, information could be one of the weapons ag uh, against the pandemic, especially as we that uh, live in the in this uh, underrepresented areas, you know. So, for me specifically, yeah, and for the people who, who working work, uh, has been working with me, we have eight. Uh, correspondents that live spread in the outskirts of, of, of Sao Paulo. And we think uh, our, our mission, what we want to, to report, especially now in these in this days, in this, in this pandemic, is uh, it's not the peripheries, can, the peripheries cannot be, cannot become the the easy bait, you know, for the audience of an announcing, announcing tragedy. Uh, we want to, we were talking about democracy in the beginning of the, of our chat. Uh, Folha <laughs> São Paulo has started uh, a campaign uh, about uh, dictatorial things, uh, etc. And we're, we're, wearing, we're wearing yellow, right? You're, you're, they're asking everyone to wear yellow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, we we want to 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 share the the, the the same information to to people who live in the in the, in the favelas. We, we want to empower them to have information and fight for their rights. Because if we can't see ourselves in the media, we think uh, we, we don't exist. So we want to 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 put the, the news on, on, on uh, everywhere, you know. You, you, I got to tell you, this, uh, what you just described also might, in some ways, answer part of a question someone asked here, uh, at least on the part of uh, some newspapers. Uh, the, uh, someone says, Wagner mentioned that COVID has shed light on a lot of inequalities in Brazil. And I think this is uh, from Taylor. Uh, and, and and I think in other countries too, especially when compounded with widespread anti-racism protests. But how can we assure that things don't go back to normal and that systemic inequalities remain on the forefront of the media's agenda? The reason that question is so important is because reporting like, we all know reporting as journalists to be episodic. <laughs> um, the uh, this one day it's a it's a story the next day it's not uh but i guess the what's asked here is how do you make sure this is this stays on the media's agenda and that's why i think this campaign by um a folio uh del sao paulo is so interesting because they what what seems to be happening is an understanding that the issues of black lives if you will or people of color lives and the issue of democracy and COVID-19, how this pandemic is wreaking, wreaking, wreaking havoc on uh, minority communities, how they're interlocked, how they're part of the, uh, the same issue uh, in, in terms of um, what folks take away. And so they're asking uh, the citizens of Brazil, the residents of Brazil to wear yellow to wear yellow in order to signify that I am, I stand for democracy. This is something a newspaper is doing. And the reason it relates to the systemic question 
is because it's uh, it again it's an it's an integration of uh, of those issues in the United States. We cannot talk, for example, about COVID nineteen without racism. And the reason to talk about systemic racism is wreaking havoc on uh, communities of color, on black folk primarily, but also on brown folk, Latino, Latinx people. Uh, and it becomes important for me as a journalist, for example, uh, a, 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 um, um, an investigative journalist, to take a close to look at this issue and how it is wreaking havoc on, uh, on communities of color in the United States in the relationship to the lack of health care uh, and supermarkets that are nowhere to be seen uh, in those communities and so on and so forth. Let's go back to uh, Ada in the UK. And if you, Ada, can you talk about uh, the relationship between the protests that have been going on there uh, and the coverage of COVID-19 and how those things can be better integrated, if you will? Though that coverage can be better integrated. Sure, I, I love this question. I'm so happy that someone posed it. Um, I mean, it's it's so obvious for, for us at Media Diversity Institute, since we it is our job to be looking at systemic inequality all the time that, you know, COVID-19 was gonna be a story of structural racism from the start. And it goes back to what you were saying, where these voices that now are being platformed, maybe three days ago, were, were being pushed to the margins. And um, so, but yeah, this has been a question that I've been asking myself is, you know, there's all this momentum here right now, but how do we carry it? moving forward because we do need to integrate this this uh, foundation of understanding structural racism and structural inequality into every story going forward not just you know kind of a minority media the way media diversity institute is but something you know this needs to be mainstream like this this very absolutely needs to be a mainstream way that journalists see the news and go about doing their work so um you know, I, you know, at MDI, we do trainings sometimes where um, we go into newsrooms, we talk to media decision makers about how to make sure that they have diverse newsrooms, that they're cultivating diversity, that they're seeing the news in this way. We've helped um, design a master's in diversity in the media with University of Westminster that uh, integrates academic curriculums about structural inequality and academic frameworks with traditional journalist training like you know learning how to make a podcast or a radio or tv broadcast or something like that um but this absolutely needs to be something that is more knit together going forward because it's it's not only the right thing to do to be accurately reporting on what's going on in our world but it, it makes journalism better it helps people no better stories, no more interesting stories, just have a better grip on what's going on and who's affected and um, just just better understand all of these dynamics that are going on. So it re it's a really crucial job for journalists right now to be saying, you know, this is this is an amazing moment that we're seeing the Black Lives Matter movement has been forcing this conversation and um, but how do we keep it going going forward because that's our responsibility. Yeah, indeed. Um, I got to tell you this. Uh, I'm loving this panel, by the way. Uh, I'm thank you. I want to thank all of you for participating. We're not we're not through, but I just wanted to say that midway through. Um, one of the questions that's that's very critical here is um, about the do's and don'ts, if you will, of reporting on communities of color and uh, and periphery uh, communities, uh, those from, from Cabrera to the to the favelas of Brazil to uh, uh, the poorest parts of uh, London, so on and so forth, and Bristol and uh, Liverpool, so on and so forth. Uh, and for that matter, in India and, uh, and uh, Pakistan, around the world, we we have, uh, by the way, uh, viewers of this webinar from around the world, and and many of the questions uh, relate to the do's and don'ts of reporting on communities of color and or uh, peripheral communities. Uh, what should we be doing as reporters if we've never reported on these communities before? You go first, and then I, I think I have a, a, a response as well. Who'd like to uh, 
answer that question again. What should we be doing as reporters if we've never reported on these communities before, if it's, if it's new? You go ahead, Thomas, please. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Philip. Uh, so basically, maybe some of the tips I can share in terms of covering our communities. Uh, like for example, people need to understand about the diverse culture of our communities because uh, like in Kibera, we have diverse tribes, we have diverse cultures. So when somebody is coming up, come, coming to Kibera, they need to understand these dynamics. They need to understand the way of living, for example. They need to do lots of research, uh, how people communicate, how people dress. You know, even, even your appearance matters a lot because you can't expect a Jones to come to Kibera, you are wearing like a suit, you, are, you know, like you're going to the office for an interview, for example, and you're coming to interview people in the locality. People will think like, huh, maybe you are, you are a police or investigating like a story, something. But you know, try to understand like, how to, can I dress, for example. And then another element that is also very important is like, uh, before, you, before you, 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 you bring out the cameras to start recording, understand, you know, what is the content of, of this story? You know, what is the context? Because I, I normally see, uh, like, I normally get calls or emails like, hi, Thomas. Uh, I'm doing this story and I need a source. So like you get a call like this morning and the journalist needs a source like in the afternoon. You see, this source is not even prepared. And then you start making calls. It takes some time to convince someone. So I'll advise like before even just them coming, like prepare early, like even send an email maybe a week earlier, uh, identify your, so these are the sources that I want to interview the community uh, so that by the time you are coming, it's easier to be identified with this community or with your sources because sometimes I see it's not very easy to, for strangers to just like, you know, you are people coming out here with cameras, it's intimidating as opposed to the eyes of the source. And uh, they might give you not full information that you might expect. Uh, and, and, and also that what I've also seen is that uh, some of the media gurus like in the, in, in the world, like they have the muscle, they, they have the financial muscles. So they'll come and even pay sources to tell the story, which I know it's not right because ethically it's not right. Uh, so, and for me, like when I go out and interview the same sources, I'm not paying anything. Uh, but some will ask like, hi Thomas, why, why are you not paying me like journalist A, B and C who paid me like some money to, inter to be interviewed? Because when you pay sources, it means they'll decide what information to give you. Uh, and you'll, you're not able to get more diverse information. Is, is, that, uh, is, that, is, that payment, is that payment coming from, that you're talking about, is this coming from Kenyan uh, journalists or is it coming from outside journalists, foreign journalists, for example? I'm curious. Uh, this is both, both national journalists and also the, the foreign journalists. I, I, I agree with you. The notion of paying uh, sources is, is extremely problematic. Uh, uh, it's I, I, it's an absolute no no. Uh, so I think that that's that's really good advice. Uh, Wagner or Ada, what, what your comments? Uh, Wagner, go uh, on. Yeah, we 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 create a, a kind of guide. We with uh, 10 uh, principles, 10 tips uh, of journalistic uh, coverage of the peripheries because uh, a lot of young journali journalists, a lot of young uh, students uh, ask us, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> ask us uh, how about you to go to these places or to use some uh, terms. So we create uh, 10 principles, uh, obviously without the pretension of presenting uh, red-made formulas, you know, but uh, in, Sao Paulo, uh, in Brazil, there's a word in Portuguese called carente. Uh, I, I think in English is needy, uh, but here there's, uh, there's value judgment. So, uh, people are plural, so we don't have to put a word that, that there's a value of judgment. And uh, another, it seems obvious, but it's not, because a lot of, there are a lot of uh, young journalists, students uh, from uh, rich schools, they're, they're, 
they don't have access, they don't know what means uh, living in a favela. And one thing we uh, use uh, to say is be careful with sensationalism and avoid cliches. Uh, remember that children in the periphery and residents in general are not poor people. Uh, and, uh, uh, and another, don't, uh, another one, don't un uh, under underestimate the political capacity of the residents of the periphery. Uh, people think uh, people who live in the favelas vote in the same guy <laughs> and it's not true. So we listed 10 tips uh, and it, it, it is in Portuguese, but I think uh, people can put a Google Translator and give some access to this this content. Uh, yeah, I, I was hoping to put up the translated uh, <laughs> uh, point, uh, but uh, it was in Portuguese, so some people understood it, not others. Uh, we, uh, by the way, I just want to mention, we only have about four minutes left, so I'm going to want to get on it here, and all of you. Uh, uh, there's an interesting comment here from Kudai. Uh, in India. It said, Namaste from India. I think George Floyd changed everything. Inequality that had been happening all this while, but to make the, this disappear once and for all, we have to look deeper into the roots of racism and discrimination. That's something we've talked about. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, another point from uh, someone from Brazil. This is, uh, I'm going to, uh, forgive me, I'm going to mess your name up, something awful, but I'm going to try my best. It's uh, Guelia. Uh, uh, but journalists from Brazil have been following Wagner's and Phil, oh, thank you. Wagner's and Phillips, Phillips' work for quite some time now. Happy to see you both on the same panel. It seems to me like favela residents in Brazil are turning away from traditional news organizations such as Folio Global and getting their news of fake, mainly fake, uh, this person says, from WhatsApp instead. How can we make journalism itself more accessible and democratic? for these communities. Okay, keep those in mind. And let me go down a little further. Um, let's ask this of Anna. I have a question. In the so-called West, much of the Black Lives Matter rhetoric is centered around shifting the burden for education about racism onto white people. In addition, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color in the West face systemic exclusion and discrimination from media institutions. Then how can we say that payment for interviews is unethical? That's the question posed, should we see payment for interviews to communities of color in the West as a form of decolonial wealth redistribution? That is the one of the most interesting questions I have ever heard. And uh, what's, your, what's your comment on that? I think that is a really interesting question and it kind of, it's part of a, a, a bigger, you know, a dynamic that we're starting to see happen with questioning some of journalists, some of traditional ethical rules. Um, when we're looking at the Black Lives Matter protests, I mean, at MDI, we've run articles, should a journalist be able to attend a Black Lives Matter protest as a protester, which according to traditional ethics, maybe not, but, but then, you know, how, but how does that play if, if someone is a black journalist and they want to be standing up for black lives? So um, as far as paying a source and the specifics of that, I mean, my journalistic instinct is absolutely no, no, no. Um, I think that we do, but I do think that there's other ways that journalists can maybe support the idea of reparations, of, um, you know, of, you know, even breaking down what does that idea mean, even breaking down what are accessible ideas to to be advancing that might not necessarily be something like paying a source because I do think that there is an ethical line in terms of paying someone and then only getting the information that that they want to give you or that they think that you need and that that is something that needs to be talked about and something that does need to be considered but I, I do think that there's there's a lot of other ways that you know, pe pe people need to be talking about these ideas. People need to be talking about these inequalities and people need to be talking about rectifying these inequalities. And journalists do have a very, very valuable role in that, that I, I don't think that they're taking advantage enough at this moment. You're muted again. Thank you. Actually, someone, uh, someone made a very interesting point here. Uh, this is um, Milika from um, 
I'm not sure where Milica is from. Uh, British media do pay their sources, experts, who provide their views on certain issues. Well, the, the same is true here in the US. Uh, MSNBC, for example, has a roster of experts and they, uh, they do in fact pay them. Uh, WGBH has a, a midday talk show uh, in New England in which we pay people to come on, uh, on board to give their point of view. So it's, it's, it's an interesting question uh, and an interesting uh, response. I guess the easiest thing to say is that it's complicated. Um, I personally don't believe that I, that I, would, to, I would pay um, uh, an interviewee. It would, it, the whole notion of paying sources I find problematic, but I do understand this framing that um, uh, folks have responded to, uh, responded to uh, with this this issue, it's totally understandable. By the way, we can go over a, f a few more minutes uh, because I think this is an intriguing uh, discussion to say the least. Let me take one other question, then I'm going to ask uh, all of you I just to summarize. Please go ahead, Anna. Oh, I mean that kind of that question for me. It's sort of inspired something else um, that I'd, I'd love to say. This, but I mean, I just I do think that also that people from marginalized communities need to be treated as experts as well. You know, often you have this dynamic with with journalists where it's like, oh, I'm going to talk to this person from a marginalized community, and then I'm going to confirm it with an expert. But but why aren't the people with the lived experience experts? Not only lived experience, I think uh, if we talk about the do's and don'ts, I think uh, what, for, for, for me personally, I, I don't believe, uh, and this is, this, and this dictates our report, uh, that, uh, that objective reality, uh, which has always been constructed from uh, what has con been considered those in power, uh, we've always considered objective reality in the United States, for example, to be what you hear from the State Department. <laughs> uh, despite all the contradictions, uh, those, for example, that came out of 9-11, uh, for example, and the, and the pretenses and lies that were developed in order to rationalize a war. But yet we continue to go back to the same sources of, of, of credible information uh, when, in fact, uh, we should be incredulous, uh, skeptical of uh, questioning whether or not that information uh, is, cred is, is credible. So one of my dues is uh, to look for a multiple, uh, on a complex story, to look for multiple sources of information, uh, to rely on data when it's applicable, uh, to go back to my roots, uh, and that is to say my instincts. The reason I got into this business in the first place it's because I felt that uh, people of color, minority communities, and marginalized communities were being disparaged uh, and, and covered in, in ways that were problematic, to say the least, that did not reflect the, my reality within, those, uh, within my community. So I go back to my, uh, my, my training, my learning, uh, my instincts, uh, that, uh, uh, and that poor folk are going to often be uh, treated in a very different way in terms of coverage uh, than rich folk. Uh, and so f one of my, uh, again, dues is to look for, uh, for opinions that absolutely reflect, you know, people's lived experiences uh, in communities, whether it be the poorest parts of Detroit or Boston or, or London, or whether it be, uh, whether I'm covering caste as I recently did uh, in, uh, uh, in India. Uh, and uh, at one point with Thomas in Kibera uh, in, uh, in Kenya. Uh, I, I was there, I forgot to mention. Uh, I've also been uh, to the, some of the favelas in, in, in Brazil. I'm afraid not in Sao Paulo, Wagner, but in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro. Um, let's, uh, let me just see if we have, uh, if we have uh, time for one other question. Uh, excuse me, one second here. Uh, let's see. Well, I, there's some comments, and I guess you guys could could respond to this to the comments here. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, this is indeed a very interesting and important discussion. I'm grateful to you all for organizing it. Hopefully many more of these discussions, panels to come. This is from Sumaya. Uh, thank you, Sumaya. 
Uh, and uh, uh, there's a nice comment here to me, and I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tebby. Uh, and uh, to Thomas, Anna, and Wagner. Uh, one is, this seems to be a question, so I'm going to see if I can uh, read it. I observe that media generally tend to lead with their questions based on their personal opinions and lack approach to our communities. And to be honest, most African migrant communities don't fully understand the news as it's presented here. Journalists need to be mindful of that. Uh, Thomas, what's been your experience in that regard? Oh, here, you, un unmute yourself, yeah. Uh, uh, like, like for me, like for me, I'm just like, it's like when I'm going out to talk to my community members, like, because I'm also coming from the same community, at least I'm able to understand the diverse issue that affect my community. So for me, I've never had a major issue uh, with my community when it comes to how I report about our issues of the community. Yeah, that's my thought. I Appreciate that. Uh, folks, so we're, uh, it looks like we are winding this down. Uh, a lot more questions, but I don't think we're going to have a lot more time. So I'd like to get each of you to take about a minute to sort of wrap this up. Again, a lot of the coverage of COVID-19, we have to be aware, is informed by both of, of, there's some very good journalism out there without question, but some of it is informed by stereotypes. Some of it is informed by the leaders of these countries who engage uh, largely in misinformation, disinformation, and outright lies, uh, like uh, the president of the United States, Donald Trump. Uh, and so how do we do it better? What is your advice to journalists at ba to essentially circumvent uh, these purveyors of untruths uh, and to get at the uh, information that folks can use that is practical, especially for poor, marginalized communities and communities of color? Uh, Anna, let's start with you. Sure. I mean, I, I think it just goes back to educating yourself. Um, it's something that nev never, never stops throughout your life. I mean, we all have our biases and we all, you know, we as journalists, we all are producing work now and look back on work that we produced five years ago and are like, oh, I would I would do this and this and this now. So it's, it's just a sign that we never stop learning to be um, looking at educational resources, look at journalism that you admire, um, think outside the box. I mean, I think that right now we are in a situation where ideally we, we want to be hiring a bunch of people from a bunch of diverse backgrounds, but also COVID-19 has meant that we're slashing budgets left and right. So we need to be clever about how we go forward. But um, the most important thing is to be accepting structural racism and structural inequalities as facts, not as debates, and you know, be, be doing our journalism with that kind of social justice in mind going forward. Uh, Thomas, uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, from my perspective, I'm thinking like uh, even just for a journalist out there, is just, as I make my team member says, like uh, it's good to read widely, uh, also do your research. Uh, I never stop, never stop learning. Like look at the sh like the social media platforms, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You know they are very good platforms for our story ideas, and that's where like you'll find someone will post like a uh, an issue, or it's some it's an innovative, and you can easily pick that as a story idea, because I've I've done that quite often, especially through LinkedIn profiles where people share the innovations. Uh, something that is coming up, and you're like, hmm, this can be a good story idea. So I'm thinking uh, we can also use the power of the social media just to give us that a uh, good start in terms of how we can report it differently even during this time of COVID. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Wagner? Trying to create a, a podcast and send it <laughs> uh, by WhatsApp. <laughs> I, I love, like I said, I, I just love that idea. Folks, my, my, my suggestion is that we uh, take into account what all of you had said, is expand our framework of assumption. Uh, 
the framework of assumption, if you will, is that which we basically we, we go to all the time. It's like a well. That's our reservoir of thinking about where we're going to get a certain idea. And my idea of, uh, of framing comes from, again, my experience growing up in uh, Detroit, uh, experiencing the uprisings in Detroit of, uh, in the, in, as a kid, but nevertheless seeing those in the 1960s, seeing what's happening down in the streets of uh, Black Lives Matter and elsewhere. Uh, I go to various, my framework of assumption is influenced by everything from The Economist magazine uh, to The Nation, uh, to talking to folks uh, on my block currently, uh, to talking with you. Uh, again, the framework of assumption is, uh, is so important uh, to me. It's influenced by poetry. It's influenced by books like the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander's book about systemic and institutionalized racism in the United States. And so it's, it's a combination of what you've all have said. It's a question of expanding your knowledge base and figuring out ways of determining, uh, of, of, of basically uh, gathering facts and letting those facts basically uh, uh, help dictate, influence uh, your story. So that's, that's, my, um, that's my approach. And so when I'm talking about COVID-19, and I just did a story about a, a woman who, uh, in uh, a poor community here in Boston who died uh, from this disease. And my approach to that story was to look at not uh, the, a story about her having underlying conditions, but the story about the fact that she was in love with her garden <laughs> uh, and her garden symbolized everything that she loved about life. In other words, I think we all want to humanize uh, uh, some of the most marginalized people out there, not treat them as a, a, a statistic or simple data point. Uh, but to basically explore the lives of the most marginalized. Uh, that is my, uh, my suggestion uh, in, as a passing uh, and perhaps closing remark for this International Center for Journalists Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. And I'd like to thank uh, all of you, Ada in the UK, Wagner in Brazil, Thomas in Kenya, myself in the United States, uh, for this great discussion. We'd also like to thank Stella Roach for basically being the producer for this. Uh, Stella, thank you. Hello? I don't, I don't, yeah, hey, we can hear you oh, now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you. <laughs> How long was I muted for? About a minute. Oh, that's a long time. <laughs> okay. Talking to yourself. <laughs> okay, talking to myself. Okay, I, I hit something on this, uh, this device here. My apologies, folks. I just wanted to say, look, thank you very much. Uh, this uh, has been a great discussion, International Center for Journalists Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. And I wanted to, uh, again, thank Anna, uh, thank Thomas, thank Wagner, Anna in the UK, Thomas in Kenya, Wagner in Brazil for this great discussion. And I want to thank Stella uh, for, uh, for, uh, for basically producing this. Thank you very much. And, you. And, and, I, oh, and of course, we want to thank our, our, our audience around the world. For tuning in. If you have questions, folks, you can get in touch with us on Facebook, International Center for Journalists, Global uh, Health Crisis Reporting Forum, uh, or uh, through email, or however ways you communicate with the ICFJ. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.